Welcome to the Film Director's Craft. I'm Rachel Carey. I'm a filmmaker, and I also host a discussion with current filmmakers about the specifics of how they make their films. And the purpose of this is to capture some hands-on techniques that current filmmakers use and also talk about how those inform the films they make and why those are useful for the kind of films that they're they're putting together. So today I'm really excited because I'm talking to Sophie Hyde, who is a brilliant filmmaker. So thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thanks. It's my pleasure. If anyone is not aware of Sophie's work, it is fantastic. So I will give a little bit of background. She's the director of films, including the recent Good Luck to You, Leo Grand, starring Emma Thompson and Daryl McCormick, and Animals, starring Alia Shawkat and Holiday Granger, which is wonderful, and also the coming-of-age film 52 Tuesdays, which was shot over the course of a year and explored a teenager dealing with her sexuality and a parent's gender transition as well. And Sophie Hyde has also worked in television and documentary, including creating the TV series Fucking Adelaide, which is a lot of fun. Her work uh, tends to be really visually beautiful and really visceral and honest. And it often centers around themes around sexuality and gender and people's conflicted relationship to social norms. And you can find Good Luck to You, Leo Grand on Hulu streaming and most of her other work on major streaming platforms. It is brilliant. I'm so excited to talk to her about it today. And I want to encourage people to check it out. So thank you again for being willing to talk about how you put some of your films together a little bit. That's great. I mean, I love listening to someone else explain my work because it's like, oh, is that what my work's about? I love this. That's what I do. Yeah, exactly. So I'm going to jump right in. We're talking about directing, uh, but some of your projects, you've worked on the script, you've helped develop them, but I want to sort of zero in first on just pre-production. Once a project's been greenlit and you know it's going to happen, what are some of the tools that you find useful for just getting into that directing headspace? You know, are you doing research? Are you watching other films for reference? Are you doing readings of the script? Like what is, what are some of the things you like to do to kind of get into that mentality? Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard for me to separate um, the kind of parts of it sort of from the development into the, the, the pre-production and being greenlit, except to say that once you know a film is gonna be made at whichever stage that is, it's so much better in terms of how you develop. Like for me, it's it's a much richer and more exciting way to develop because there's a kind of certainty about whatever we do now, we kind of get in the mud and work and, and it's going to come out as something rather than a kind of scarcity sort of feeling, which is like if we get this wrong, we might not get this financed, you know, which yeah. I don't love. Um, but, I mean, I... I do like research. Um, you know, I came from documentary and I often use kind of um, material that exists or things. I like I like to sort of have a handle on things from real world experiences, whatever that may, might be. So that could be that for on, on Leo Grand, for instance, we were talking to a lot of sex workers to kind of ground that film and sort of think about that character of Leo, you know. On other things that might be, for animals, for instance, it was written by an author who um, it was sort of very much based on her own experience. So research becomes different, which is that you're trying to tap in and understand that experience as well as bring your own kind of feelings to it. Um, but on something like animals, it becomes much more about understanding the place that we were filming and sort of researching that place. You know, so it's different on each movie. But I do like research. I like a lot of visualization. So I spend a lot of time kind of bringing together images um, that I'm, I don't just use kind of to pitch. You know, I think we think of mood boards and stuff as a kind of pitching tool. But for me, it really is sort of discovering and finding a combination of images that help me understand character and as well as visual style. So those two things kind of combine. And those images might include words and um, ideas as well. Um, so I do a lot of that. I work with my partner, Brian, who's the cinematographer and editor of the films. So that's quite an unusual thing. So we spend a lot of time talking about things. And he likes very much to find kind of more precise 
references. So he's like this scene from this film feels like this, do you know, M- much more than I probably do. When I think about references of films, it tends to be a kind of feeling or something that I'm looking for, you know, in that mm-hmm. inside that work. So um, Call Me By Your Name, for instance, was a very strong reference for Leo Grand, um, and but a very specific one because it was all about kind of the, the balance between subject and object. So um, I have this feeling that in Call Me By Your Name, they do something really beautiful with the character of Elio, Timothy Chalamet's character, which is that we watch him and he kind of feels like he oftentimes would be kind of the object of a movie because we we look at his body a lot, but he always feels like the subject of the film. He always feels like we're understanding things from his point of view. And I've found that really a thrilling position to be in as an audience, that those two things melded instead of being separated. And that was some, that's something that I look for quite a lot in a movie to be able to explore both of those things. So that's, yeah, I think, I think that's how I come at it. I realise I don't have a, like, very specific technique that's drawn from any one person or whatever, but I am, um, it changes each film and, and we'll talk about it later, but that includes my sort of rehearsal process and everything is kind of made up. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, I that that makes a lot of sense though. And it is actually sort of specific. I think that idea of observer and observed and so on comes comes out in the films as well. So how mm. about casting? I love to ask people, you know, what they do when they're in the casting room because I think it varies. So I know there's there's been a lot of Zoom casting and so on over the last couple of years, but but do you have anything in that process that you like to do, either just working with actors or if you're having a conversation with an actor about a role, are there things that you kind of come back to in that process? It's always been really important to me to talk to actors more than kind of just see them do things. Um, I mean, that's easier when you hit people that you kind of already know their material and so you you know, you don't really need all of those actors to necessarily read for you. Um, But even when on my earliest films, like my first short film that I did, I remember not really wanting to get the actors to read, but wanting to have a proper conversation with them. Because for me, I need to kind of find a place where we meet and that um, a huge part of like working with an actor for me is, is, investigating and discovering how they work or what the best approach with them is because it's different for everyone and I don't want to come in and sort of just put my take on it I'm I'm like some actors are very intellectual they want to talk a lot like I do and some actors don't want that and so you have to find that in your process of like okay how do they how how do they work the best and kind of come at them that way um so I guess I always get really uncomfortable when I do when I watch casting tapes and I've learned to become better at it but I remember the because I didn't start like that I mostly started yeah meeting people or knowing having to kind of get on the same page with somebody and and not necessarily auditioning them um or auditioning for 52 Tuesdays was more like a workshop where we kind of talked about a lot of things played around with scenes you know it was more about getting a feel for if we could do this whole thing together that's a commitment Once I started to get to tapes from, Tuesdays, it was they had to be in for the whole the whole journey of that film right they had to be in for the whole year so we had to know that they were adaptable with us that they would bring what they needed that they would be up front like a whole lot of things um and that continues now I still need to know that an actor is ready to do what I would like them to do and also will voice up to me if they're uncomfortable about something. These things are really important to me in the process. But, yeah, I started to get tapes and I would be like, oh, like I feel so nervous and uncomfortable for them. They're, like I just hate They're very them. vulnerable, right? I think that's part of it is they're, they're very vulnerable. They are. I remember getting tapes in and, and I'd start watching and I'd have to get up and stop for a second and kind of come back to it and, like, it's really difficult. Um, I feel for actors. And the truth is that some actors are really good at, at tapes and it, it doesn't always reflect somewhat how someone is to work with. So that's a real, so I, I think a lot about that. Um, and the, the, 
Yeah, I've done a mix of it now, but um, I tend not to rely on tapes as much as as the conversation with somebody. Mm -hmm. Mm. Have you had chances, uh, and this varies based on budget and a whole bunch of things, but how do you feel about rehearsal before the shoot? Because watching Good Luck to You, Leo Grand, and I'm sure I'm not Bruce person who's observed this, but it is sort of structured like a play. You know, it's a very contained piece and it, and it's a limited number of actors and, and so on. And I was curious, I was like, you could rehearse this like a play, but you could also just shoot it like a movie and have them kind of come in fresh. And I was curious just in general, how you felt about rehearsal, but also in that case, how you made that decision and 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 how you thought about that process with them no I'm absolutely all for rehearsals I wouldn't make anything without rehearsing and um, I appreciate that there are some actors in particular who like to just come in and but for me um, there's a period of time where us becoming like getting onto the same page as each other us um creating a kind of shared history together as director and actor and also for them to create something together is really important so when I think of rehearsals it's not always straight rehearsing it's like um, I create a lot of tasks uh, which I which will be different with different actors depending on their relationships what kind of relationship I want them to kind of discover um, or build um, but a huge amount of that, yeah, is that I want to walk onto the set with my actors feeling like we are already united as a team in the film that we want to make and that that is a shared purpose and a shared vision um, rather than coming on and kind of just seeing what everyone brings and sort of guiding it on set. So for me that's very, very important um, and oftentimes I've rehearsed in a way where there will only be very few scenes that we would actually do as scenes, something with a heavy dialogue or lots of people in it that's comedy, for instance. I definitely would want to rehearse that scene. But mostly I want to work with cast to sort of feel like they've got the right physical relationship together or kind of emotional connection to kind of build what they need rather than like running scenes so much. On Leo Grand, that was different though. Um, and Emma and I talked a lot about that process that I have, which is not so much rehearsing. Um, and we kind of came into it like that, like we're going to use this time to really explore our bodies and our feeling about the film and what we want to say and to to build the relationship and to and to find the physicality in particular. But actually we ended up realising, no, we, we do actually need to not so much rehearse the scenes, but certainly block out the scenes became really important because we were shooting in 19 days, which is really small, and the dialogue's incredibly heavy. And to shoot in that way, we needed to do very long takes. And so they needed to know where they were at any one point. And they needed to, like, learn lines, which was a massive job at that time. And so they had to go over that material over and over. There was no way of making that film without them reciting learning 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 and so to know where they had to be in space became very important and so we did actually block it out very precisely you know in our rehearsal room and then and we would block it on set as well with um, our DP sort of on our off days um, to kind of make sure that he could then block the the camera moves um, so yeah it became much more like a conventional kind of rehearsal Although more of our rehearsal was spent, yeah, looking at physicality and our, our purpose than, than that, probably. So do you ever give actors assignments like, I want the two of you to hang out kind of, you know what I mean? Or build relationships even, just like go out and get a drink kind of things? Or is it oh, all yeah, happening? Very as no, no, I very much do that. I mean, my rehearsal weeks are intensive and for me. And, um, uh, and... I need to use everybody in every way. So with Leo Grand, that's easy because you are with just the two people that you have. That's, there's no, you know, um, and those two people in that case, they were, they were doing a lot of work on their own anyway because of the material and having to recite lines. So they were spending a lot of time together outside of that room even. But on something like Animals or fucking Adelaide, yes, I would need to, my process is like, 
you two go off and do this very specific task, like go and buy us all lunch and make us all lunch for later. And you two will be with me doing like a physical exploration. And you guys, um, can you create a, well, on fucking Adelaide, it was like everyone had to do a family Christmas performance. So all through the week of rehearsals, we were doing other tasks, but they also knew they had to do a family Christmas performance uh, with various combinations of them. And so for them, building and creating that material becomes part of how they get to know each other. Um, on animals, for sure, they had to go and, like, do, um, have drinks at certain bars or take each other on tours, depending on their roles. Um, certainly I wouldn't give that to people that were kind of fresher in terms of their relationship on screen. Uh, but, yeah, it changes for each. So, you know, the two sisters in that, for instance, they had very specific tasks that were about getting to know each other as humans as well. Yeah. Mm. And it's, yeah. I would imagine also for you, your films often have these very intense family dynamics of super close siblings and things like that. And I would imagine that's really useful for kind of making that stuff feel lived in as yeah. well. So It is. I think actors need to... Or it, it, it's great for them to, of course, they're bringing, of course, they bring that ability to do that anyway. You know, I all I, and most actors that you work with can just create that, you know, but to give it that extra bit, to, to know that they've had this really in-depth conversation before they had to sit there and do this role where they're super close is, it's a really, I, it's all about kind of creating a, a an environment, a a, a process that allows them to kind of sink into that in the in the strongest way you know and because I've worked over my career with a range of like non-actors or new actors and then more established actors there are time I come at it from that place of of wanting to guide and help people that are new to acting and so that even more kind of feeds into that this gets a little bit into moving into sort of on set but I one thing I I wanted to call out is you know specifically you mentioned physicality and watching your films an awful lot of them strike me as sort of being about having a body you know whether it's drugs and alcohol use or sexuality or just comfort with the body or gender like it feels like the characters are really inhabiting their bodies or or are figuring out how to do that and and I was wondering if you had any things you did on set with actors to just get them grounded in that way, because some of them, you know, whether they have to play a scene high or whether they, you know what I mean? It feels like there's a really specific physical quality that that they achieve really nicely in the films. And I was wondering, I was like, how did you pull that off? <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, I definitely have an obsession with the body and the experience of having a body and and how strange that is and like our kind of front face of bodiness and then the truth and reality of like everyone does poops and do you know like I'm I mean I'm pretty interested in how disconnected those ideas can sometimes be do you know um, and one of the things I always loved about animals and the book the original book was her her conversation about having a body that that is in that book um, but for sure I'm interested as well in, I don't want to see the surface of things. Like I don't, you know, we can see the surface all the time of how we present to the world, but the truth of the, the of, of all of us is that we don't always hold ourselves. We don't always present when we're on our own or with people that we're intimate with. And I find it very disturbing when I see a, a film where people are private, but they still seem public. That's very disconcerting to me so the kind of idea of privacy and who we are there becomes important so I do do in everything a fair bit of work on kind of releasing something about the heldness I, for me like so Emma was an interesting person though because Emma's so skilled already Emma Thompson and you know so she in inevitably, you know, her sense of like a character, so much of that character is about being held, do you know, that's who that character is. But like anybody, there's got to be moments where that drops. And so finding that is the thing. And, and in the case of Nancy and Leo Grand, that really only happens very late in, in the story. I mean, we see glimpses of it at other times, but you can see it 
for Leo, for instance, the other character in that very early on, as soon as Nancy leaves the room, that he becomes different, you know. Um, I don't exactly know how I do it because it will be different with each actor. So Holiday Granger, we spend a little bit of time just sort of trying to like hone into like the idea of relaxing and releasing all those things that we hold and particularly actors sort of are so used to being seen and being in the public eye. And Holly kind of does that naturally, but even that kind of was to kind of really like release her from that perfection and that feeling of like holding her body in a certain way was really fun to do. And that was just a one-on-one -on -one experience. Um, but, yeah, it just, honestly, it just depends on the actor um, and who they are and what we need for the role. Yeah, I don't have any. Yeah. No, I, no, that's actually very, that's very interesting, though. And and, and the, the way that sexuality is de depicted and explored, it's often, it's, it's awkward, too. You know, it's stuff that people want to hide what they what they want they may not even be sure of but it's also something they want to hide sometimes from people closest to them so just know. that act of acknowledging desire it seems very vulnerable a lot of times yeah do you know people are always like you know your uncomfortable sex scenes and I'm like oh are they, unco <laughs> are they, are they uncomfortable yeah because you know it, it's the only way that you can be there is to sort of try and sort of find some it's a bad word, but truth or, you know, I need to reveal myself to my cast. Do you know, part of part of what I do is that there is a vulnerability and a shared kind of humanity that we're trying to find. Um, and that means things that you feel a bit uncomfortable about or that, that where you hold a little bit of shame yourself is like opening them up as being normal in the conversation and recognizing that we all feel those uncomfortabilities and we all carry these kinds of shames in different ways kind of allows us to sort of put ourselves out there all of us in a certain way I think um and because as a director you kind of play a fool sometimes you know you you can't be cool like you can't sit there and be like I'm so cool like you're having to go I'm asking a whole lot of you. I better also front up and sort of reveal something of myself. And um, and so that's sort of part of what we do. It's not like you sit there and talk about your deepest shame. It's like, how do I express that this is normal, that this is what we all feel somehow? Mm -hmm. It also gives them a purpose to revealing yourself. I think for the actors, I assume that like they're, they're doing this vulnerable stuff because the audience needs to recognize that maybe it's an it's yeah. kind of a nice way of thinking about it too yeah um, and it's not like I'm saying the actors are all showing themselves exactly on screen but somehow you find something in yourself to allow the the specifics of that character to kind of come out I think let me ask about so you you started in documentary and I'm wondering you know, 52 Tuesdays struck me as using some elements of documentary in the way that you shot it, because there was a little bit of sort of finding where it was going to go as you went, I'm sure. Um, so I'm wondering just how do you think that your background in documentary sort of affected how you shoot narrative? You know, do you do you look for certain things or do you think about covering scenes in different ways because because of that background? I certainly am looking for the surprise, like the thing that I wasn't expecting um, in, in when I shoot. Like it's like I don't want to create the situation where everything is exactly as I envision it in my head. So in fact, that's not my goal at all. Um, and I really kind of rate directors who can do that. But for me, I'm no Wes Anderson. Like I'm like, you know, I want to set the parameters and sort of discover something all the time. So something will shift, you know, it's like what I bring to it, what the cast brings to it, the camera, like everything kind of becomes this new thing that I can't foretell. Um, and I think that comes from that documentary sort of background. Those things have always crossed over for me, like the telling of a story is there in a documentary very strongly for me. It's not just like you find a story. <laughs> it's like sucking in and learning about people and all of those things and then kind of presenting that as something for an audience is how I always thought of documentary. It's like, and that's how I think of, of 
um, making fiction as well is like those all those ideas and what you want to say and like how you sort of still kind of constructing a story but you're trying to find truth and reality and moments of familiarity inside that and moments of surprise I suppose um so those yeah they all kind of meld together for me and 52 Tuesdays is a great example of that which is there is nothing about the story that we're drawing on um any of our actors or our lives exactly do you know none of us had that experience but we were all inside the experience of shooting every Tuesday and growing older over that time and the world changing and so the feelings that we were experiencing or our cast was experiencing would sometimes come into the work um, so for instance Tilda who plays the teenager she started to get very um, interested in the idea that she didn't have any control over her life there were too many people controlling her but she also kind of wanted to be told what to do and so that struggle that she started to have informed the character and the story even though it wasn't about a girl shooting a movie do you know um, like and so those that's how we kind of take take from the world <laughs> take from our actors that probably gives it more authenticity to whatever you're we're, you're doing with them if you have that mm -hmm. how about just set design I also I think about animals and the way the production design was done felt very grounded and real and specific um are you working with the same person on that or like how do you convey like those little specific details because it was it was really beautifully done in that case. Yeah, we've actually always worked with different production designers on almost everything we've done. Um, there's only one repeat, I think. Um, no, I'm always working with different production designs, but some great ones. Um, I loved doing the design on animals so much and Louise, who was our production designer, was just really kind of went there with us the story of the book is very much more sort of street and a bit kind of like ordinary or something. That's like its style. Um, but I always really want to, especially meeting Dublin, especially kind of finding Dublin as a location, you know, the shift that happened of kind of this slightly glamorous but kind of dirty thing that went down was so fun and it sort of informed the characters, the girls, and they're kind of, they became kind of a little bit glamorous with their eye makeup, but a bit grotty and gross. And that had to kind of be reflected in the production design as well. And the streets of Dublin led sort of to that. But also, Louise, you know, I I wanted the palette to be quite clear in that film. Um, and so she had to build things like their apartment in in places and um and they are it's it's quite unusual it's sort of not what you expect for a film about two girlfriends who are like taking a lot of drugs and um but it sort of came out of of Dublin and a desire for kind of something about the the nightlife you know something about the feeling of being at the party you know the feeling more than kind of how it truly looks on the outside. Um, <laughs> it has to be appealing and romantic in some way. Exactly, yeah. romantic, but also a bit gross. And it's sort of this like, um, yeah, so, I mean, I really loved doing the production design on that. And then Leo was a completely different thing, which was like I wanted a neutral room but sort of seductive in some ways or like sensual in some ways but neutral and um and so that was really, really different. And building that with Mirren, our production designer, was um, that, that was all remote mostly. I think we did almost all of it remotely. Um, but, you know, that was just kind of having to understand and think about all our shots in advance and knowing the style that we wanted and therefore like building the actual set to, to, to function for our, our camera. And the biggest thing about that was, you know, the the huge window and the, I wanted there to be light, daylight mostly, but any any kind of light in almost every frame. And so that became what sort of drove our design, actually. And I think Brian, the cinematographer, and Mirren, the production designer, would have wanted there to be like coloured walls or something, something that would make it a bit easier, you know, like these, you know. Um, but I, and I didn't want to go white, white, because that's very hard to manage for a whole film, but to find something that still felt neutral. 
that well, didn't feel the over quality I felt like the quality of the light was doing a lot of the work for shifting yeah. the mood in different scenes like you use yeah that's right that light quality to indicate different things which maybe in a less neutral space wouldn't have come across as well I think that's right yeah that's true and in the quality of the light and that Brian's very good at natural light as in like using sunlight in a really beautiful way um and so I had really wanted that rather than kind of dark or night which was kind of the the, the first or most obvious choice for something about sex work I suppose um yeah and I guess animals had been said a lot at night so I was like let's do it more in the day <laughs> It's good though. I think that counterintuitive, it gave you a lot of interesting places to go. So that's really neat. Do you have any, you know, you've gotten at this, I think a little bit already, but in terms of just working with the crew, do you have a sense of sort of establishing a rapport with them or how you think about, you know, I think you talked about vulnerability with the actors, but I'm wondering how you think about that as a leadership role which it kind of is and and getting everyone moving in the same direction and obviously if you're really close with the dp there you already have a sort of team working but do you have any sort of approaches that you think about for that yeah it's um it's good to have the same dp because you know we you you kind of are leading um the the culture of a film from that place first from that relationship first um it's an experiment for me like we've always had a small team previously and we've we've always worked with a lot of the same people originally we did anyway and so the culture of a set is very important that people felt feel like they're heard and safe and all of those things um as I started to move into places where I were work, was working with crew that I didn't know so well and I had to establish that much quicker um I've tried different things and and I mean one of the things that I always do is as we build up into pre-production and on our sort of early meetings is to try and bring something to the team that kind of comes from more what we would do with the actors. So ask everybody to kind of talk, say something in a meeting about what they did on the weekend or or talk a little bit about why they came to the movie, do you know, those, those ideas, which are really important to me and feel like the bare minimum of setting up a crew to feel like they're part of a purpose as well, you know. And funnily enough, those things seem like real anomalies in the industry, even though they seem, I wish I could go further. And over time, I hope to go much further in terms of bringing the crew into the feeling of the creation, you know. I do a little bit of like, here are my parameters. I try and tell everybody, you know, I don't want any assholes on set. I don't believe in, you know, bullying and um, and and sort of try and set the scene of how much the actors require in terms of looking after and not in a kind of pandering or sort of um, silly way, but to do what they need to do. They need us to kind of, you know, create a, a kind of feeling and an atmosphere. So I try and talk about that. And there's a lot of people on set that really respond very well to that shift, but there's always a few people on set who feel a little odd about that request. And that's because the culture of film sets isn't as much like that normally. And so it's a, it's a, sh a shift and a change. In terms of vulnerability, for sure, I'm like there's a balance, um, of course. And when I started, I hated the feeling of having to, like, show my professional self, like, of having to show that I was strong and powerful and I always knew the right choices. And I, when I started, I always felt like crews looked to directors. Um, they wanted them to, it was like a good director always knows the answer. And like, that's what a, a crew feels a good director is like that they, they know the answer instantly. And it's very hard to realize sometimes, okay, for this crew that would create a certainty but for the work to be what I want it to be, that's not necessarily the best path for me. Um, that actually my questioning and um, and collaborative kind of nature, I have to sort of become uncomfortable sometimes with the feeling that people are thinking a whole lot of things about whether I'm good or not and let go of that and be like, no, I actually, I want to know from some other people what that means or I want to think about that for a second or I don't have an answer or fuck, I'm really struggling with this today or I feel weird or whatever that is. And 
that's something that over time I feel like I've got better at doing. Um, but it's certainly something that you come up against at the beginning. For me, it was. And occasionally it will come up still. Um, I think one of the I reasons do, I, I got the interested in, like, in asking people about how they work is because I had the same perception. I remember I was checking in with my crew on a shoot and somebody was like, you do directing by consensus. And they were very dismissive. And then years later, I read about, I think it was Robert Altman, how he worked. And I was like, oh, he did exactly the same thing I did. And yet it wasn't, you know, I was never taught that some directors seek, you know, collaboration. And and so I think that's actually one of the things that set me off on this was that feeling that there are so many different ways to do this. And yet there is that sort of model of, of having all the answers that, that isn't. There is. Helpful. And I, I think I am actually like, I know a lot about what I want something to be, but I do want to hear from people and I want to consider it. And I want to be able to change that vision sometimes, but that doesn't mean it's just like, well, if six people in the room like it and 10 don't, we won't do it. Like it's yes. not, you know, there is different ways to lead and there's different ways to kind of create your vision. And um, I think it is about finding wh which one you do and kind of letting go of the, yeah, letting go of the fake professionalism that kind of exists or the fake idea of leadership, you know, that only exists in one way. Because what we know of that is that if we have the same leaders, we have the same movies, you know, yeah. and we want more different ones. <laughs> and also you're not actually a good leader if, somebody else in the room has a better idea and you didn't hear it <laughs> so totally. sometimes it's it's also getting the best out of everyone you're working with requires totally. and that can be that. really confronting when you have to lead a bunch of people but you do have to do what's best for the film and the audience too not just what makes you feel good and efficient and like you're you've got the best ideas well you kind of have to let go of that right yeah have you ever on set had a moment where you did have to sort of make a right turn and you, you know, you don't have to be specific, but where you were like, Oh, I have to redo this or I have to take a different approach here and, and sort of made turns like that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Like, um, and I hope I get better at actually stopping things when things are not working. Cause I think sometimes you kind of plow through, um, but yeah, it always works better if, if an actor, for instance, seems like they've got their elbows out, you know, and you're like, why are they being combative with me here? You can kind of keep going and trying to make it work. But occasionally it's better to just be like, hey, let's stop what's happening. Um, and that's really hard to do when there's the production of a, a film crew around you and the, you're on the treadmill of, of getting things done to, or when the DP's like, you look at a shot and you're like, I do not like this. It's not right. Like you do have to, you don't just want to be someone that's like, nah, do it again. It's unhelpful. But you've got to be able to go, I, this isn't what I thought and I know we're behind. Or you've got to make a choice because sometimes you can't do that. Sometimes you have to move and you do make, you do just go, we do need this, you know, and, we, and, and, and the rest of the day is more important. But sometimes you've got to go, I'll never use this as it is. We need to stop and redo this. And those those things are hard to do. Um, there's pivoting all the time, changing all the time. Like, oh, well, how will I get this to change? How will I, how will I help them find their place in this? Yeah, no, every second of it is like yeah. that. <laughs> so let me ask about post production then. How much have you found? that you also have to pivot during that process. There's usually a little bit of finding the movie afterward. And I'm curious how much, you know, I know if you've, if you've done documentary, there's an awful lot of that sometimes, but I'm curious how much you've experienced it. I would think more with maybe animals and 52 Tuesdays. I, I feel like good luck to you. Leo Garan feels like a more sort of script, you know, script set kind of film, but but how much discovery do you feel like you're doing in post? Uh, personally, I feel like I'm doing a lot of discovery in post and I want to be doing that. Um, I think when we, our early movies, we were really finding things in post. And I think we had this idea that like, as we got better, we would be doing that less. Um, and that that was because we were inexperienced. And in part, that's true. 
in part, like there's a lot of the material that I we would have done in post that we did in the scripting process of Leo Grand and that we really, really worked through because we knew that. But in part, I I want to be discovering the whole time I'm making something. Um, for me, if I've if I've solved the problem, just achieving the result isn't interesting enough. Like I want to be content. I want to be solving the problem right to the end. And that's when I'll lose interest. Like I don't want to watch it anymore or do it anymore. Do you know? I'm not someone who's just there to like, to. I don't get off on the kind of just getting it done um, thing. So, yeah, I come from documentaries that were very much a discovery process inside the edit suite. And, you know, I came up through an era where, you know, nonlinear editing was what I was trained in straight away, but it was the beginning of that. And, um and I can't imagine how different our films would be if we'd been like 10 years even before that or, you know. Um, but for me, the process of capturing and then discovering and trying to present to an audience the, the thing that we're just finding is part of it. And that's in the documentaries and certainly on in 52 Tuesdays, which even though that film had very strict rules, like every Tuesday had to be in the film in consecutive order still took like a year of post-production to, to put that film together um, because it was such an unusual kind of rhythm compared to a, an, another film. And um, so I I always, in, in Animals, for instance, I was like, <laughs> mostly it's going to be composed music. But then as I started to edit, it was like, oh, no, it really needs like score, uh, soundtrack, and which seems obvious now when you watch the film, but nothing's ever obvious when you set out to make a film and I think back to when I was like writing essays at uni and essays felt like that to me too it's like you know oh the the hill is so big to climb and you're sort of piecing things together and trying to work out what do I think about that this is what making a movie is like for me like putting a meal together but it's not quite going right how do what do I add here or take away or whatever to come up with something and keep going until it feels right once you've done it, you could do it again so easily. You Like you could write an essay again, right? But for me, that's not the joy of it. Like I don't want to write rewrite that essay. I don't want to remake that same meal exactly the way it was done because there's no joy for me in that. <laughs> so, yeah, that's the bit that is pleasurable and hard, yeah. Yes. I think music is a particularly tricky thing. I'm always curious how people pick their composers because it's such a, for me, that's such a a, a very, it's hard to imagine the music in a movie, you know what I mean? And how it will translate to a particular project. So how do you think yeah. about just composing and music in general? Yeah. Is there something you're looking for? it actually is probably one of the things that I find the hardest in the whole thing. I have like a great deal of respect and love for musicians and composers and in my own life. And, but it's not something that is, is super, is very natural to me to, to, I don't have any language for it. That language, I haven't got better at that language, you know, like, um, and I have worked with some such great people and some of them repeated, like, you know, continued to work with a few times but it's always a process of discovery and finding and it's never exactly what I set out to do at the beginning um, in truth. So it's always a like a kind of conversation and exploring different music and ideas. And I say on 52 Tuesdays, there was one song that our composer had written that was kind of the reason I remember wanting to work with him, this really particular song. And so then we thought that would make it into the movie, but it never made it into the movie. It never worked for the film. Layers of it did. Um, uh, but it just, it didn't, it didn't function. And so I have often worked with composers in a very kind of layered hands-on way, which some of them love and some of them hate, um, which is like really experimenting with tiny bits and them doing passes and us putting it in the edit suite and taking away strands. And it's a, again, it's a strong collaboration. And some of our composers have been, have relished that. Like, yes, let's back and forth between this and that works really well. Um, it's not certainly not easy and it's time consuming. And some have struggled with that where it's like, they want to be more in control of, of that musical arrangement. Um, but yeah, I've never found music easy ever. 
it's, yeah, it's a really interesting art form. I find the, the same thing. And I know what you mean about, about composers. Some of them like to be like, but I wrote the song for the scene. And then, and then it's hard to sort of see it treated almost like another shot where you might move it and, and do things with it than I yeah. anticipated. Yeah. on drop out things. And like, to me, that's, it's all very handmade. And so inevitably it has to be a little bit like that. And on Leo, the composer that we worked with, we were working very fast and very late in the process. And we, I would give detailed, detailed notes, but he was in Ireland and I was in Australia and we didn't talk very much actually. And, but, but he was really like offering a lot and we were taking things out and moving things and he would look at it. And so it actually was a quite a smooth process in the end. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's so interesting. Let me ask a couple of, of final questions. Um, first of all, do you, you sort of touched upon this already, but is there anything you feel like you had to unlearn about directing, like something you thought the job was that you realized that it was not? I know you talked a little bit about feeling like you needed to be in charge, which I think is yeah, one I of the I think that is the main thing is like, it's actually just that you've got to let go of showing that you're a good director to be a good director like I think as soon as I feel like I'm trying to show somebody or I'm trying to prove it then I'm not focused on what my job is um, and my job is like on set it's almost entirely like presence it's almost entirely being there and watching and seeing what's being captured and kind of helping to steer towards what you need um, so a lot of it is letting go of all of the planning and all of the thinking and whatever and being right there in that moment. Um, as soon as I'm having to like, yeah, show somebody like that I am in control, that's when I know it's not working. Um, that would be the main thing. And is there anything we didn't touch upon that you feel like you do that a lot of folks don't do? I mean, I work a lot with writers, whether I'm writing on a film or not, um, to kind of, you know, make sure that the film that the script is is in a place that I feel really good about um knowing that I may change it again in the edit suite um I guess that really unique relationship that I have with Brian which is that he's shooting and editing and that means that that he's that we're constantly trying to kind of solve and 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 rediscover the things that we wanted to do you know right through the process um and that there's a very, we, we try very hard not to kind of find any blame in what happens, that sort of everyone's there to kind of create the film. Um, I don't know what else. No, that's interesting. I, it, it, it occurred to me with that relationship that, um, you know, a lot of script supervisors, the early editors were also script supervisors on set. And so they were figuring out the coverage and then also cutting the film back in like silent Hollywood way back in the That day. makes so much sense. That makes yeah. so much sense. If you if you had the right kind of writer that could script supervise and edit, I mean, that would be also a kind of path you could imagine. Um, because because what like sort of having other people that are helping to look after the story and to kind of your job as a director is always to kind of steer towards what you think it is or to like find what it is. But they, you do need these other people with you to do that as well, to kind of catch the balls or to, to notice things um, often side, oftentimes alongside your vision or to kind of know what kind of thing you want. So for me, it's like whoever they are, you find them on every film and they can be in different roles, you know. It's like you find those people who are helping you to do that and it doesn't matter what role they're in. They're working with you to get there and it, and it changes every movie for me. Mm. Mm. And yeah, and just to make sure you didn't miss anything too, which is also yeah. a wonderful yeah. gift. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. That was amazing. I really appreciate all the detail you went into and it was completely fascinating to hear about it. So thanks well, so much for sharing it all. Though.